Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to be talking about pseudo-alleles. Before we get into that, make sure that you know you can get free study notes from my channel. So if you, if you use the link in the description box below, you can get um, a whole bunch of free study notes, including a PDF of today's final board. So today's board, once all the notes are on it and all the blanks are filled in, there's a picture of it at that location below, so check that out. Um, also remember to subscribe so you can get more free study videos. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we can really talk about pseudo-alleles, I need to make sure that you understand some other terms, gene, locus, allele. Um, once we have covered those, we'll go on to talking about what pseudo-alleles are and the two criteria that have to be fulfilled for two alleles to be pseudo-alleles. And then we will talk about the origin and give an example. So let's start over here. First, we'll talk about gene. What is a gene? It is a segment of DNA that codes for a specific trait. Remember that in humans, we have um, two versions of every gene. We inherit one version from our mom and one version from our dad. The locus is the physical location of a gene on a chromosome. So like if you're looking at a map of a chromosome, you'll, you can see that you know, this gene is located here, and this one is located here, and this one is located here. So the locus is the physical location of a gene on a chromosome. When we're talking about multiple locations, like the locus for um, multiple genes, the plural of locus is loci. So L-O-C-I is the plural of that word. Now we'll talk about allele. Allele is where it gets a little bit more um, difficult to understand if you don't have a strong genetics background. An allele is an alternative form of a gene. So basically certain genes, um, many genes in fact, can have multiple kind of versions. There are differences in the nucleotide sequence caused by mutation that can lead to different forms of a gene, and those are the alleles. So some of the best known examples are with Mendelian genetics, where you think about Gregor Mendel and the pea plants that he was studying, and you know there were flowers uh, that could be purple or white. Like there was a purple allele and a white allele for the flower color gene. And there was um, green seeds or yellow seeds for the seed color gene. So the alleles are those alternative forms or versions. Now, if you've got this and you're ready to move on, stay with me. If you feel a little nervous still about like the differences between alleles and genes and what exactly alleles are, I do have another video that is going into much more detail on alleles versus genes and also going over some additional vocabulary, things like homozygote and heterozygote. So check that one out if you need a little bit more background. If not, and you're ready to keep talking about pseudo-alleles, let's get to that. Pseudo-alleles refer to alleles for, this is important, I'm going to put it in all caps, for different genes. So the examples I gave earlier when I was talking about alleles over here, being like different alleles being like the, the purple flower color or the white flower color, that's for the same gene, okay? Different like alternative forms of the same gene are what we call alleles. Pseudo-alleles are where we're talking about alleles that are actually for different genes and fulfill both of these criteria. Before we move on to talking about these criteria, I want to make sure that you know that pseudo-alleles are not the same as pseudo-genes. I know those sound very similar, and we're talking about genes and alleles and pseudo-alleles and pseudo-genes. Pseudo-alleles and pseudo-genes, not the same thing. I do have another video specifically on pseudo-genes, so if you need to know what those are, check out that video, but not the same as pseudo-alleles. Pseudo-alleles refer to alleles for different genes that are First, functionally related. This means they control similar aspects of the same trait. So they're not, um, they're not different alleles for like the exact same gene, but they are alleles for two separate genes that contribute 
to the same trait. So we'll talk about um, an example in Drosophila where the trait is the size of the Drosophila fly's eyes, okay? So the same trait, but their alleles for different genes. So this has to be true. They have to be functionally related and they have to be located very near each other on the same chromosome, such that they are considered closely linked. I'll say that again. I hope you've heard that word before in a genetics class, gene linkage. They're such that they are considered closely linked and rarely separated by recombination. If you need a little bit of refresher on this, I have a video, uh, The Law of Independent Assortment, that's in my, <coughs> excuse me, that's in my Mendelian genetics playlist. So you can check that one out if you need to remember like what recombination is and what linked genes are and unlinked genes. Um, but basically the gist of it is that when you have, I'm gonna like draw two chromosomes here. If you've got two chromosomes, um, there can be like a recombination event where these actually break and then like this one connects to this one, whoops, hang on, this one, and this one connects, messing up my lines here, connects to this one. Um, so this is something that happens in meiosis, uh, where you have homologous chromosomes lined up, and they can undergo this recombination process. Well, if you have genes that are like on totally different ends of the chromosome, that are like far apart, they can be separated pretty easily by recombination. But if you have genes that are located very near each other on the same chromosome, that means they're only rarely separated by recombination. Are they reseparated? Are they separated by recombination? Yes, sometimes, rarely. Usually though, they're so close together that these recombination events don't happen at the right place along the chromosome to separate them. So usually they stay together. So the result of number one and number two, both of these criteria being fulfilled, even though we're talking about alleles for different genes, the result is that they are almost always inherited together. Why? because they're not going to be separated by recombination very often. It's only rarely that that recombination where the chromosomes like break and like switch arms with each other, um, that's gonna happen between these alleles really, really rarely because they're like right next to each other along the chromosome. So they're almost always inherited together and they appear to act as a single, gene. Why do they appear to act as a single gene? Well, they're almost always inherited together and they're right next to each other and they're functionally related. So they control very similar aspects of the same trait. And so typically they are inherited together, right? Like both of them inherited or neither one of them inherited. And when they're inherited together, they do such a similar thing that it's almost like it just looks like it's one one gene that's acting instead of the fact that it's actually two pseudo alleles. Now you might be asking where do these come, they, where do these things come from? Well, they probably form following gene duplication events. So this is when like, you know, maybe like the polymerase slips a bit and like copies a gene twice by accident or when there's like an uneven recombination and the result of that is that one chromosome ends up with like two copies of a gene um, when those two copies used to be on different chromosomes. So those would be gene duplication events. And in this case, if you've had a gene duplication event where you've gone from like one gene controlling a, a trait to having like a second gene right next to it controlling a trait, well, one of those genes, the duplicate, might then be able to evolve, evolve a different but similar function. So if I kind of hold up my two, you know, pretend genes again, we had the original, it got duplicated again, probably by um, these not lining up quite correctly. Um, but you got the duplicate and then the duplicate 
can mutate a little bit. Maybe um, it has a nucleotide or two or three that change. Maybe this happens over time. But it can evolve a different but similar function. So um, my favorite example of pseudoalleles is with the star and asteroid alleles in Drosophila. Now these are um, abbreviated as a capital S for star and an AST for asteroid. These are alleles that are at two separate loci, okay? So they are at two separate loci. They're on the same chromosome, but they're in two locations. Remember loci, the singular there is locus, the physical location of a gene on a chromosome. So these are these alleles are at two different locations on the chromosome. Again, probably one is a duplicate of the other, and the second one evolved a little bit different function. But they're very closely linked. Like they're so close together that they're almost never separated by recombination. Are they sometimes? Yes, but it's rare. So two separate loci, but closely linked, and they are functionally related. They both, in slightly different ways, um, because they're not the exact same gene, right? They're alleles for different genes, but they both make the eyes smaller. So they meet both of these pseudo-allele criteria in that they're almost always inherited together and they appear to act as a single gene. So we see a size trend here. This plus slash plus refers to Drosophila flies that have um, two alleles that are for like the wild type. That's not a, a word I've used in this video yet. Um, but wild type basically means like the most common or the most typical um, allele that's out there. So, and again, um, you know, these flies, they're sexually reproducing like humans. So they have two alleles from each parent. We talked about that over here. So if the fly has two wild type alleles, they have the largest eyes. But you can see like once they've got one of these star alleles, their eye gets a little bit smaller. If they've got a couple of asteroid alleles instead of wild type or star, the eyes get even smaller. If they've got a star allele and an asteroid allele, you've got the smallest eyes in this kind of um, size range. And so this shows you how complex the pseudo-allele inheritance is, right? It's not just about, well, the eyes are normal size or they're small. No, there's a range depending on exactly which pseudo-alleles um, have been inherited. And again, whereas they are usually inherited together, they can sometimes be separated by recombination, and that's why you can have some of these different combinations as well. Whew, so that was a lot. Thank you for watching today. Remember to subscribe. Remember to go to that link in the description to get your free study notes, and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching Biology Professor.